All right. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to the Dice Tower. This is Holly, my co-host, and we're glad to have you with us today. We're talking about my top 100 board games of all time, and today we're going to be talking about numbers 41 to 45. So we're getting lower or higher on the list, I suppose. So let's get right into these games. The first game that we're talking about is Goa. Now, Goa is, I guess, what you would call the epitome of a Euro game. There's auctions in it. There's buying and selling of resources. The theme is about trading in the East Indies. You know, really, it sounds kind of boring, but the game comes together very well. Players are bidding and on and buying tiles. These tiles can be plantations. They can give uh, special resources or special privileges to the player. Players are collecting resources that are, look like little bags, but I don't know. I think they look like little mushrooms. They use these resources, but what makes the game interesting is how they use the resources. Each player has a player board. And on this player board, they're using cubes to mark, their, to mark their progress. And they can try to advance each of these cubes. You, there's really no way you'll advance all of them over the course of a game. But if you advance them, you get special abilities that you can use during the course of a game. And at the end, they're worth points. Like I said, this is, this is a Euro game, plain and simple. But everything fits together, and there's very multiple paths to victories. The auction, while it's an important part of the game, doesn't dominate it. It's more dominated on what am I going to do next? Am I going to draw cards? Am I going to sell cards? Am I going to try and move one of these cubes down on the track here? Am I going to take more money? There's really a ton of things that you can do each turn of the game, and that really makes Goa, while yes, it may be typical of most Euro games, it's it's one of the best. It's, it's, it's complicated. I might not teach it to newcomers, but certainly an excellent game. Number 40... Four is a giant game. I mean, we're talking about a huge game, a game that makes the table rattle when you pull it out, and that's because it's full of plastic pieces in this game. I mean, look at all this stuff. Plasticky goodness. Yeah! Now, you may have heard of Conquest of the Empire. It came out uh, way back in the 80s, along with Axis and Allies and Fortress America, and this game actually remembers that. It's a redone reprint by Eagle Games, and it comes with the classic rules of play. Now, these classic rules of play are the, basically those same old rules. They, they fixed a few things, and there's now dice that are used just like the dice in Memoir 44 or Attack with the silhouettes of the figures on the sides. And it's a fun battle game, but you know, I wouldn't buy the game for that reason. What I would get the game for is the fact that there's another set of rules included. These rules are based on Martin Wallace's game, Struggle of Empires, uh, redesigned by Glenn Drover to use these pieces and with these fantastic pieces, with cards that show uh, intrigue, and the second game is basically one more of diplomacy and subtleties and, and trying to build your kingdom. So I have a conquer game, and I have a diplomacy game, and they're both in the same box. Mention the fact that it's a box full of just absolute gorgeous looking components, and we have a winner here. So my number 44 is Conquest of the Empire. Number 43 is a game I don't have on me right now, and that's because someone's borrowing it, because it's an excellent party game, and that is Why Did the Chicken? Remember, if, if you watched my last one, I talked about Beyond Balderdash, and how Beyond Balderdash can occasionally get ridiculous, because players will start writing silly stuff just to make people laugh, and some games just basically devolve into this absolute chaotic silliness fest, or whatever you might want to call it. Well, Why Did the Chicken? It takes that idea. Each turn there's a random joke, like, why did the postman marry the chicken? Or, why did the uh, Fruit Loop cross the street? Or there's all kinds of weird questions that come up. And then everyone answers as many funny answers as they can think of on a piece of paper. One person reads all the answers, another person's the judge, and they pick the two funniest. Now, with people who aren't very creative, this game can kind of dud a little bit, which is why it's fallen slightly in my rankings. I still think it's a great game, but you really need people who are creative or at least who are going to build upon things other people wrote. You'll find jokes that are copying jokes made on previous turns, and jokes on turns after that, and, it, I mean, some of the funniest moments ever in a party game. So, why did the chicken? Sorry I can't show it to you, but obviously it's good enough that other people want to play it. All right, number 42, Power Grid. A very, very popular game amongst people, at, at least at Board Game Geek. And Power Grid is a game about supplying power, to whatever area you're going to. Now, this is an expansion. Here's a map of Italy, and I have a map of France. Is this Italy upside down? It is Italy upside down. Let's see if we can get France right side up. There we go. 
And the original game comes with Germany and the United States. And it's very intriguing because what players are doing is they are bidding on power plants. Here you can see a couple of the power plants. And players are bidding on these power plants because each power plant gives different resources, or not resources, but allows you to use a resource to provide power. This power plant provides one power to one city from one garbage. While later on, you'll get better power plants. And for example, here's one that for two garbage will power five cities. Well, that makes the game really interesting because as there's different resources going up and down, as the, there's less resources available in the game, the prices go up, players are competing for resources, they're competing for power plants, and they're competing for spots on the map. And all that makes is a very tight financial game in which players are going back and forth trying to get um, just better positions. It's, it's, it can be very cutthroat, and there's a decent amount going on at different times of the game. And even though I have the Italy slash France expansion, and there's even an expansion of more power cards you can get, with the base game, you're pretty much set. You can play three to six players. It fits very well. Everything fits just remarkably together. It's a very mathematical game. There's a tiebreaker in it. Whoever has the most money wins. And that tiebreaker I've seen used almost in half the games that we play. Just a tremendous game. I, I think it has a long staying power. And, and you say, well, I'm not a big fan of math. I still think you might like it because the theme, while this guy looks absolutely bored, turning a knob, woohoo, the game itself is much more exciting. And you'll find yourself captivated throughout the entire time. And finally, today, moving on to game 41. This is a game that a lot of people don't seem to find very interesting, but I love it, and my gaming group does, and that's Coliseum. Some people say Days of Wonder has lost their touch. I don't know. If this is the kind of game that they're producing, then I'm, I'm right on board. Coliseum is a game which, unlike the box, you're not necessarily fighting and having gladiators and lion's dens and such, but instead you're building your own arena and trying to attract people to come see it. The more people who come see your show, the better you'll do. There's five rounds of the game, and only on the fifth round is your score calculated to see who wins. You do get score at other turns, but they don't add up. They're basically just there to get you money and to prepare you for that final fifth round. Of course, as with any Days of Wonder game, we have fantastic components. Here's the Emperor, and some councils and senators, and beautiful coins, and you'll even start with your own arena, which is placed on the board, which again is very beautiful. And then as the game progresses, you can expand your arena so that there's more spaces for those important people to land on. And all this just really, for me, is fun. There's auctions in the game. There's trading in the game. There's deciding what actions are you going to do. Are you going to add um, different abilities? Give out season tickets so that people are forced to come to your games. Try to get these really important guys to come by and visit your game to manipulate things, to trade with other players, to try and get the best show. You know, each show shows you what resources are needed, and as the game progresses, you're getting different resources. You're getting singers. You're getting gladiators, and you're getting different resources, but you're also losing some. And all this comes together, I think, in a very fun way. Every time we've played it, everyone has had lots of fun. Um, some people think that the trading session lasts a little too long, but I just found it very enjoyable, and getting all these different things together, for me, was a lot of fun. And so my number 41 game is Coliseum. What, oh, we got to put those people away? I didn't know. Okay. Well, a sterling production by Days of Wonder. Certainly one of my favorite games. And so I highly recommend this one. <laughs> There's still 40 games that are better. What are those games? Well, you'll have to come back next time. Do you know what those games are? You do not. Do you? Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Well, anyway... Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and this is my co-host, Holly. We'll see you guys 